Hi. Thanks, uh, every, everyone, for coming. Um, welcome again to one of our Microscope events. Uh, Microscope was uh, an employee initiative at Shipstead, and it has been uh, going on for quite a few months already. Uh, we ran a big event last year in Madrid. Uh, but basically, uh, we try to get uh, really uh, great speakers. And here we have Mike Land, who I'll introduce shortly, uh, with us. Um, the event uh, is uh, sponsored by the Mobile World Center. Estrella Dam is bringing in the beers uh, for the networking after the talk. So thank to sponsors and of course, Shipstead. Um, Mike uh, is currently working with uh, with us at Shipstead, uh, trying to set up uh, some things that he was very involved in the past at Google, uh, the testing on the toilet and uh, test certified programs that were very successful and really pushed colder. Uh, at Google Forward, so we're trying to do basically the same today at Shipstead. And uh, I think this is all. Thank you, Mike, for Thanks. coming. All right. Thank you. So I'm live. Everybody can hear me? Great. So this is going to be a talk about change. It's about the rainbow of death model that helps explain how my fellow instigators and I across the chasm between us and the majority of Googlers to make automated testing a standard development practice. And I'm hoping it'll inspire you to break free from the standard narrative and overcome your own cultural challenges. But first, allow me to share the story of how I earned the privilege to speak to you today. So from the very beginning, I've always felt compelled to push boundaries to assert my own truth. And whenever others suggested I follow a traditional path, I would tend to tilt in a completely different direction. The standard narrative never applied to me. Eventually, however, my lack of musical commitment, or possibly talent, gave way to the creative euphoria of programming. So in my first job after college, my colleagues would tease me about my library of programming and algorithms books that we carry with me day in and day out. But then my team went through a death march, which is a crushing experience of working insane hours on impossible requirements by an impossible deadline on a fragile, untested code base that barely worked to begin with. The pressure was intense, and I wasn't my best self at this time, but somehow we did it. Uh, we met the spec by the deadline, then we were given the runway to do whatever we could to make the damn thing faster. And it was during this period of relative calm and freedom that I discovered unit testing completely by accident from an article in this magazine called the CNC++ User's Journal. With my library and my newfound testing practices in hand, I rewrote an entire subsystem from the ground up. I'd apply a design principle or an algorithm, and I'd exercise it with fast, focused, thorough tests every step of the way, rather than waiting for system integration. I could immediately validate that each, each part worked as planned and spend more time developing than debugging. In the end, my new subsystem improved performance by a factor of 18 and helped save the project. And when a bug or two cropped up, I could reproduce, investigate, or actually I would investigate, then I would reproduce, fix, validate, and ship a new version the same day, not the next week or the next month. So my teammates recognized my abilities, but they never adopted my practices despite their obvious impact. I couldn't figure out why. So at that time, my solution was to sell my house, quit my job, and then meet a woman on an online dating site whose referral led to me joining Google in 2005 in that order. <laughs> now, at that time, Google already had smart people a knowledge sharing culture, unimaginable compute power, and of course, everybody knows about the great food. It was flush with cash and positive press, and at the time, it, seemed to have, it appeared to have zero of the typical organizational bullshit. It served the people, and the people served the mission. And with all that freedom and food came a great deal of responsibility, not only to our users and customers, but also to one another. 
there were already standard practices built into the culture such that everyone was expected to conform to style idioms, submit code for review and review others' code, disseminate knowledge through talks and documentation, and generally collaborate with and support one another. All of this kept silos from forming and enabled the company and its developers to increase their capabilities and move very rapidly. We had the responsibility to help one another improve our code, our products, our con uh, company, and ourselves. Yet even though, Googler was, even though Google was doing so many things right, very few developers wrote tests. Why was that? Well, unit testing wasn't part of the MIT or Stanford PhD curriculum. Most of our fellow Googlers had never experienced a death march. Relatively few had any exposure to testing concepts or techniques or tools or had any experience informing them of their value. And on top of that, the company seemed capable of doing little wrong at the time. Its stock price and hiring rate showed no signs of slowing down. How could one claim that a lack of testing was hurting it? So we found it impossible to be able to prove this objectively. Yet Google's core priority structure was based on data-driven decision making, which by all accounts, including mine, has served the company very well, but it made it extremely difficult to convince people that an investment in automated testing was gonna pay dividends. Even so, some of us felt that the company was at risk of collapsing under its own success. The size and complexity of its code and products exploded with its growth, and though Google tried to hire the best and provide a supportive environment, the development operation was getting so big it was starting to break down. And no project was a better example of this than the Google Web Server, or GWIS for short. The program running the Google.com homepage. Now, I wasn't, I wasn't ever a member of the GWIS team, but I was close with many of its members. And in 2004, uh, GWIS was not a glamorous assignment. It was basically a dumping ground for lots of unrelated changes as different teams tried to get search features integrated into the home page. But imagine if you break Google.com or you allow it to be broken. Search results could be bad or unacceptably slow, and all these thousands of queries per second turn into thousands of unfulfilled promises, and the company doesn't only lose revenue, but also trust. So eventually, when Bart Metarata became tech lead of the GWIST team, he believed the automated testing would go a long way towards curing these ills of complexity and fragility. So the team took a hard line. They would not accept any more changes to GWIS that didn't come with tests. They set up a continuous build and religiously kept it passing. They monitored their test coverage to ensure it went up over time. And they wrote a testing guide and policy and insisted that contributors both inside and outside the team followed them. And despite the initial unpopularity of this policy, the GWIS team held firm and eventually turned a corner. They became one of the most productive teams in the company, integrating a large number of changes from different teams each week while maintaining a brisk release schedule. New team members could make productive contributions to this complex system very quickly thanks to good code health and test coverage. So ultimately, this radical policy enabled the Google.com homepage to expand its capabilities rapidly and thrive in, a, in an amazingly fast-moving and competitive technology landscape. So GWIS was clearly a model of automated testing effectiveness, but it was still a relatively small team in a large and growing company. And given all of the other forces, worldviews, and personalities at Google, and our inability to prove the value of testing using data, the GWIS message was drowned out by Google's standard narrative. We had to find ways to amplify the GWIS message and build a bridge across the chasm. Now, this chasm model comes from a book called Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore, and explains how different people adopt change differently. And each of these classes of adopters has an important role to play in the change process. The innovators and the early adopters are like-minded seekers that I like to call instigators. They're the catalysts for change.
but their unfiltered barrage of new ideas all the time can be upsetting and costly to the organization. The early majority is open to change, but needs accessible tools and procedures. They're like a, a fad filter. The sympathetic audience willing to give us the direct constructive feedback we need to polish and scale the most worthwhile ideas. The late majority is the stabilizing force, the repository of organizational knowledge that slowly absorbs and production, productionizes ideas proven to best serve the organization. And they aren't as eager for change as the early majority, but they're happy to adopt proven practices. Finally, we have the laggards who challenge the instigators most directly, questioning or outright denying the value of a new idea, and they usually provide the most vocal and active resistance. However, their direct unfiltered criticism may inspire the instigators to find unexpected common ground and more effective solutions than they otherwise might. So getting the right messaging to the right people in the right order is key. And crossing this chasm between the instigators and the early majority is well make or break an initiative. Now what I've added to this model across the chasm is from the title, The Rainbow of Death. So I borrowed this model from another fellow ex-Googler named Albert Wong. Uh, he called it the framework for helping, but I have a weird sense of humor, so I, I gave it an update. Um, but the idea is it basically lays out the steps that the instigators need to follow in order to carry their initiative from one side of the chasm to the other. So this intervene step, the instigators with the necessary experience write write the tools and resolve critical issues themselves. To validate, the instigators give the early majority a means of visualizing and marking progress to demonstrate the value of the initiative and to encourage further process or progress. Inform, the instigators teach the early majority how to do the right thing the right way. Inspire, the instigators articulate a vision and compel the early majority to act on it. Mentor, the instigators cultivate relationships with the early majority, providing them with insight and moral support and coaching them to acquire new habits. And finally, empower. After the instigators have provided the power and the knowledge to make the right thing the easy thing, the early majority exercises their new capability without guidance. They have become experts themselves. And this progression of concepts demonstrates the theoretical transition from dependency on experts towards empowerment. However, it's not a hard ordering requirement. Parts of the rainbow can be developed in parallel using resources at hand. And then over time, you could see where more work is needed and fill in the remaining steps. Even if our efforts seem scattered, random, and disconnected at first, we can see how they actually reinforce one another. By the way, if you're getting hung up on the word death in the title, uh, just hang on to the end. I'll reveal everything. So it's the responsibility of the instigators to build this bridge across the chasm, and we testing instigators, despite the challenges we face, still had a lot of advantages by virtue of being at Google. We had access to information and tools that facilitated its discovery. We were empowered to develop and promote a vision, and we had the freedom to combine forces with li other like-minded folks to pursue a common goal. So shortly before I joined Google in 2005, Bart joined, a, joined forces with Nick Lasecki to form the testing grouplet. So grouplets were teams of uh, volunteers that were pooling their 20% time from the famous Google policy where Googlers could work on a, a project other than their primary project. Uh, so these volunteers could pool their time and address an issue affecting the entire company. And eventually I did succeed uh, Bart and Nick is one of the co-leads of the grouplet. Now we had very little budget, absolutely no authorita, but we had the freedom to explore creative solutions to the problems facing automated testing adoption, often relying on GWIS, <clears throat> on the GWIS experience as a model. Now to better frame the change process and the challenges we faced, let's apply Kurt Lewin's theory of social change, which consists of the unfreezing phase in which behaviors have to be unlearned, the changing phase in which new behaviors are learned, and the refreezing phase in which 
new behaviors become standard procedure. It also describes driving forces that compel change and restraining forces that work against it. So Google developers were growing ever more frozen in an unsustainable pattern, and we believe that automated testing was necessary to break that pattern. But at the same time, there was an array of restraining forces pushing against its adoption. People mostly had no experience with testing outside of the slowness and brittleness of the status quo. And they were under constant delivery, pressure, delivery pressure while feeling intimidated by many of their peers. So who could blame them for not testing when they couldn't afford the time to learn? So economists call this temporal discounting. And the idea is if somebody's given a choice to push a feature now without tests to prevent a problem in the future that may or may not happen, they'll tend to ship and hope for the best. Combined with the fact that the tools were getting slower and slower with the company's growth, it made it impossible to reach a state of flow. And this combination of immediate pain and slow tools in pursuit of a distant, unclear benefit made the right thing way harder than it needed to be. So arguing against these excuses people had would have been counterproductive. They actually did signify real problems that we needed to solve. And the standard narrative from which these problems emerged would not provide their solution. So we began experimenting with a lot of ideas to start chipping away at these problems, starting with the resources at our disposal. So we were fortunate. We had an in-house training organization that still exists. It's called NGDU. Um, and we would work with this organization to develop code labs, which were you know, training materials developed in-house, uh, a new hire lecture. And of course, at, at Google, new hires are called Nooglers, so that's where that term comes from. Um, and we also organized a lot of tech talks, and we'd give away free books with all these tech talks, and then we'd often see the books collecting dust on shelves throughout the company. Um, Eventually, we introduced a new terminology. Instead of unit and integration tests, we introduced small, medium, and large because inside Google at the time, a unit test was a test that ran in less than five minutes. I'm not saying microseconds. I'm saying that a unit test was less than five minutes in the parlance of the times at Google. A regression test was everything that ran longer. So we introduced new terminology so we could introduce rigorous definitions and explain what the different types of tests were and what they were good for. Finally, we worked closely with our internal tools teams to reduce the friction that the slow tools created that in turn amplified the I don't have time to test excuse. So already we can see how these pieces began <clears throat> to fit into the rainbow. And you'll notice the early emphasis here on inform, because the natural first inclination is to drop knowledge into people's hands and hope it results in widespread adoption. But as we've learned time and time again, and being American, I'm especially aware of this now, uh, information and facts alone aren't always sufficient to change people's worldviews and behaviors. Still. These activities helped the grouplet itself converge upon concepts and language that helped us articulate our message moving forward. So in the beginning of 2006, we had a brainstorming session trying to set our quarterly goals. And we were getting frustrated and exhausted. And we were literally asking ourselves what we could do to take all this good information we've pump, kept pumping into the ecosystem and make it actually stick with people, make them actually do something with it. So after we were bouncing ideas around to the point of getting completely silly, and also completely by accident and unbeknownst to us at the time, we hit upon possibly our greatest breakthrough, testing on the toilet. Our weekly testing periodical that is still published to this day, 11 years and, 11 years and still going. So by publishing an episode each week in almost every bathroom in the company worldwide, we were able to gradually raise the degree of testing knowledge and sophistication throughout the company. And people would apply new concepts and tools that they learned about in their spare time 
to uh, their production code. And eventually, what was really cool is TOTT episodes became like the official style guides. They were references that people would use to justify approaches to the code they had written or to recommend suggestions to code they were reviewing. And we eventually recognized that many teams were interested in testing, but they needed a few hints as to how to get started. So we developed the test certified program. So this was a roadmap based on the GWIS model that on the one hand, it was designed to hack the measurement-focused, data-driven priorities of the culture by providing measurable tasks and levels and actually a ladder of teams that showed how high people were in, you know, along you know, the, the progression. And it also helped people overcome that first big scary obstacle of, well, where do I start? How do I even begin? And so we also provided volunteer mentors to each of the participating teams. And these mentors would give advice to the teams and ultimately validate their progress in climbing the ladder. Now eventually some bigger teams, large teams with big visible projects, they became interested in test certified, but they needed more hands-on help than a test certified mentor could provide. So we pitched an idea to Google executives, got approval and funding, and we launched a team called the Test Mercenaries. Now, we were a team of full-time internal consultants, if you will, hired to help teams improve their testing practices by taking all the testing grouplet ideas, tools, and techniques and apply it to these teams' codes, teams code directly, using Test Certified as both a guide and a goal. And so the mercenaries also worked very closely with the tools teams, providing a steady stream of feedback that drove innovation as we applied the new internal tools to some really challenging projects. So we can see more of the rainbow fitting together. Test certified served to inform, of course, as well as inspire and mentor, but the validation function was probably the most critical. Pe you know, teams could take concrete steps towards making a tangible impact on their code quality and productivity. And we sweetened the deal by providing teams with uh, people, you know, teams that were participating in the program with these build orbs, which were these glowing information radiators that provided a very conspicuous visual uh, indication of the state of a team's continuous build. And also hacking on these orbs, putting them together, and writing driver software for them. It was a big source of fun and inspiration for the, act for the grouplet members ourselves. And then we also began taking part in organizing in, in the proud Google of tradition, or, ugh, sorry, all this talking, all these words, sometimes they get out of order. You know, it's like I've got some sort of an asynchronous, uh, you know, consistency problem in my brain sometimes. Um, let me try again. Let me restart the, uh, the request. Okay, we also began taking part in, in the proud Google tradition of organizing fixits. Where these were basically uh, one day events completely volunteer organized to address important but not issues. Important but not. <laughs> there are definitely issues. Important but not urgent issues. Um, and these events, they weren't approved or mandated by the corporate hierarchy. There were no executives saying everybody has to stop what they're doing and do this, but they were actually very encouraging of this activity as well. And as it turned out, writing tests or fixing broken tests or climbing the test certified ladder, these were all perfect fix-it tests. And the urgency of fix-its created a critical mass of both volunteer and participant effort that ratcheted up testing awareness and drove the mission to a new plateau each time. So now, after two years, we really started to roll, but also started to drift apart. The grouplet, testing on the toilet, the test certified program, and the test mercenaries, they were, they were all very robust, independent entities. And I felt like I was the sole common link between all of them. So I started prodding folks to come up with a unifying vision. And we eventually hit on the right one, getting all teams to test certified level three, whether they were actually enrolled in test certified or not. So this mission not only aligned all the efforts of all our different teams, but enabled the perfect partnership with our testing staff, the dedicated testers provided a framework they could use to encourage their dev teams 
to test and catch bugs up front, which freed the testers themselves up to provide higher value quality feedback. And if I might be petty for a moment, a little bone I have to pick, I personally sold this concept to our testers in 2007 before a particular author uh, joined the company and kind of assumed credit. Um, but anyways, notice that Empower uh, re remains a bit light in this figure. The tooling innovations weren't quite in widespread use yet, uh, which limited the impact of all this knowledge we were sharing. We needed a way to drive tool adoption company-wide as rapidly as possible. And eventually, we realized fix-its were an incredibly powerful means of doing this. In the revolution fix-it in January 2008, that fix-it made the first huge dent in, I don't, in the I don't have time to test problem by rolling out these powerful new cloud-based uh, build tools, such as uh, Blaze, which is now in, uh, open sourced as Bazel, which is a GNU make replacement that takes advantage of all the other distributed build infrastructure. And the primary cost that teams had to pay in order to adopt the new tools was to clean up their dependencies and to ensure all their build inputs were version controlled. Because you know, building was so slow and painful, people would resort to dirty hacks just to get things to go faster. But now that we had faster tools, they could get rid of the hacks. And when they got rid of the hacks and were using faster tools, guess what? It's easier to start testing now. So not everyone participated in the revolution, but everyone was impacted by it. I mean, for weeks afterwards, I would hear people in the hallways or have other conversations here and there online about revolutionizing their builds. And then, that September, the financial crisis indirectly demonstrated the testing groupless impact. I mean, we were not the sole reason Google survived the crisis, but during that time, when the company let go most of its contractors, which meant most of the manual testers and most of the test mercenaries, actually, there wasn't a quality crisis or a development velocity slowdown. People by that point knew what the right thing to do was and had the power to do it. The right thing had become easy enough. So now, three and a half years in, we've saturated the culture with testing knowledge and better tools, and we had the support and momentum we needed to finish building that bridge across the chasm another year and a half later. So the test automation platform launched during the TAP Fixit in March 2010 was a continuous integration system built upon the revolutionized tools that could test every change and clearly indicate the source of a breakage, often so fast that most breakages were already reported and fixed before most people noticed. So after five years of breaking from the standard narrative with success uncertain for most of it, we succeeded in making automated testing an indispensable practice of the Google development culture. So what, what did the things look like? What was the observable impact five years after that? Well, Rachel Potvin uh, gave a presentation at, at scale in 2015 called Why Google Stores Billions of Lines of Code in a Single Repository. And it contains some astonishing figures which are two years out of date as we look at them today. But while she enumerates a host of other tools that comprise the ecosystem, she makes a point of saying specifically, TAP is our automated test infrastructure without which this model would completely fall apart. So the reason I keep telling this story over and over is to humanize this aspect of Google and to make it accessible and to provide insights into the strengths, vulnerabilities, and flaws of the humans that comprised it. In understanding and empathizing with these characters and their struggles, we can better see how our own thoughts and behaviors influence the course of events. We can draw from these examples the courage we need to stand up in the arena for ourselves and to help create a better future. Even so, some of you may look at me and only see the scarlet G the mark of the outsider, whose experiences are unique and unusual and either don't apply to your standard narrative or threaten it. Google is special, you might say. They 
have smarter, younger people who are willing to take more risks. But, you know, haven't you heard what I've said up here? It, it's a human organization like any other. It got some things right that many organizations didn't. But it still consists of humans, some of whom are open-minded and brilliant, but plenty of others who are arrogant, overconfident, ignorant, and insecure to a fault, just like anywhere else. There were lots of developers straight out of school, but there were also lots of people who'd done a decade or more in Silicon Valley and elsewhere. So remember, it took five years and many bold parallel efforts before all of these smart, risk-taking people finally got on the bus, and there was only a handful of us behind the wheel for most of that time. Or you might say, Googlers think they're so smart, you know, what they did at Google is supposed to be the way things are done everywhere. It is true that we picked up a lot of amazing ideas from our experiences as Googlers. And are we supposed to abandon those when we leave and go to other organizations? Is it true that those ideas, those tactics will never work anywhere else? There's no guarantee that you know, anything that we did specifically at Google will work anywhere else. But maybe some variation or combination of these ideas are worth a try. And it's also worth remembering, it still took us two years of experimentation until we understood the problems well enough that we were able to articulate a mission and a strategy. We didn't have the clear vision. We didn't have the specific plan figured out when we started. We likely never would have figured these things out if we were waiting for both to snap into place before doing anything. But ultimately, this talk isn't about the flyers we put in the bathrooms or the certification program we developed, the specific tools we rolled out or the big fun events we had. The real tool I'm offering is this framework, the rainbow of death, for examining why these things worked. A tool to help you develop some empathy for the fears and challenges your colleagues face so that you can discover the right solution for your environment. A tool to break free from the standard narrative that's holding you back. I want everyone to develop their own narrative, not just passively listen to mine and comfortably conclude that perhaps my friends and I were just lucky enough to get hired at Google. Because while we enjoyed some advantages, we worked our asses off for five years when many of the forces of the company's culture were working against us. Those numbers of Rachel's would not exist if we didn't spend five years breaking from the standard narrative instead of being waiting to be told what to do or waving our fingers in people's faces, calling them stupid or dangerous. So while these technological advances we made were critically important to making the right thing the easy thing, the greater challenge was creating the cultural space necessary for lasting change. We had to be patient with ourselves to work out the nuances of the problem, and patient with our colleagues to adopt our practices once the pieces were in place. And believe me, during you know, most days during those five years, whenever I'd see somebody send a you know, code change for review and it didn't have tests, and the reviewer approved it without any tests, I'd be furious. You know, I'd want to go up in their faces and shake them and be like, don't you know how irresponsible you're being? You know, stop being so damn overconfident. Don't you know how much you're hurting your company? But I think it's pretty obvious to most of us such an approach isn't likely to persuade people to consider an alternate viewpoint. And not everyone will adopt the same practices or new practices with the same open mind or the same degree of resistance. They won't all have the same educational background or life experiences. In short, they won't have the same worldview. Everybody feels like their mind is in the right place or is the right balance of open and closed, whether they always seek the truth to question and reaffirm it or whether they never do. As instigators, it's our responsibility to accept that truth and work with it. For example, today, I have the privilege of standing up here before you, of deciding the path and presentation of this narrative I'm the one striving to inspire you, the audience, to go forth with all these ideas and make change happen. But for each of you, this is a very personal experience. You all look like this, too. It's great. Everybody's smiling. It's like, this is wonderful. I can't get enough. Um, <laughs> but your focus is on the effect my words are having on your thoughts and your perceptions. You have your own reasons for, for why some of what I'm saying resonates and why other things maybe don't. And something, you know, whatever you're hearing, you think, oh, this is brilliant. You know, so-and-so at the back 
you know, back at the office, they need to hear this. You know, they might think I'm peddling horse shit at best or snake oil at worst. Or they may hear it and they'll think, cool story, bro. You know, but it's not going to work on my special little snowflake project because of these, you know, stupid reasons, X, Y, or Z. Or maybe they'll hear this, some of these ideas, and it will resonate, but they don't feel like they have the knowledge, the power, the freedom, or the safety to act on them. And to a vocal and tenacious minority will always remain the opposition party, and we can do little to fight that and gain little in doing so. We have to succeed in spite of that. And the point is we can't rely solely on metrics and logical argument to, save, to change <laughs> to save minds. There you go. That's a Freudian slip for you. We can't rely on metrics and logical argument to change minds. Metrics can mark progress and validate improvement. And our logic must be as sound as possible while asserting our case, but they're far from sufficient to inspire action in either the skeptical or the powerless. Metrics and arguments don't change most minds. Experiences do. And the key to creating the necessary experiences is to discover the true pain and address it. Don't get caught up in whether or not people have the, the right to feel or complain about such pain, whether they're entitled or stupid. It's not your job to judge the people or the pain. It's your job to understand it and to make it go away. The problem you want to solve may not be the problem you have to solve first. And this won't feel natural, it won't feel right, it'll feel contrary to every instinct you have to meet resistance with an opposite and greater force. It's easier to attack than to engage, because that's the standard narrative. And the most important thing to remember about the standard narrative is that it's the very thing that created the situation we hope to change. It's comprised of the motions we go through to perform business as usual, with an incomplete or mistaken awareness of the downstream consequences. How can we change other people's worldviews if we're incapable of changing our own? And as I promised, this is where the word death comes in. Specifically, the death of our own ideas, the death of our own ego. If we cling to these from the fear that our grasp on reality will slip and the world will fall apart, there's little hope that our rainbow will take shape and carry us across that chasm to connect with the others and to heal that pain. The rainbow of death can help you approach your own problems with clarity and courage, with an open heart as well as an open mind, as you shape plans to break from the standard narrative that are the best fit for your culture and capabilities. Now, I love this painting, Caravaggio's David with the Head of Goliath. I think it's particularly compelling because maybe many of you already know, most Americans don't, that it's a self-portrait of the artist as Goliath. And where others might find this, this image and its theme jarringly morbid, I see an inspirational breakthrough moment of self-awareness because as Caravaggio discovered after a lifetime of battling his own demons, we in the testing grouplet discovered that the greatest force resisting us was not external. The real opposition, opposition we faced was the com I keep wanting to say country, was the company's own identity, our own conditioned instincts, our own culture. Often the, uh, the greatest obstacle to the change we want to see in the world is the way we as individuals, organizations, and society at large continue to see it. So now I put the question to everyone here. What is the pain that the people around you are really feeling? Where is it really coming from? How can you provide the knowledge and the power necessary to relieve it? What resources do you have available? And what fellow instigators are waiting from all different corners to join you in crossing that chasm? What can you do to intervene, validate, inform, inspire, mentor, and empower your people? And how much longer can you afford to wait before taking action? Will you decide to follow the standard narrative or to choose your own? That is it. Thank you. Oops. Did I do that? Oh.
maybe someone has questions, we can facilitate and bring the mic around. So anyone? And I should say, even though this was mo mostly a higher level cultural talk, if you want to get into some technical details, that's good too. That's okay too. <laughs> okay. Um, I was wondering um, how uh, how big was the impact of those um, toilet ad advertisement? Uh, well, if you're asking me to measure it, um, <laughs> no, no, well, <laughs> well, people I, I, started to read it for sure. But uh, mm -hmm. did you see like an, a huge impact or something like that? Well, it's one of those um, ripple effects, right? Like. Uh, the most immediate impact, of course, the first thing we heard when we first did it were from the people who were just like, oh my god, I can't believe that you've invaded our private space with this spam. That's the California accent, by the way. Um, I'm an East Coast kid, so. Um, yeah, so there was a little bit of that, but then a funny thing happened. We got a steadier, louder stream of comments after a couple of weeks saying, when's the next one coming out? Um, we went from, you know, oh boy, you know, we're getting people who are freaked out by, you know, invading the bathroom to, wait, you know, there's actually an audience. They, they want more of this. And then they're, you know, and part of it was like the medium. Like if we had just sent out an email or just given yet another talk, handed away yet another book, it would have been like, oh, this happens every day. But suddenly it's like, whoa, this is, this came out of nowhere and it's kind of funny and these people have a sense of humor and they don't take themselves so seriously that, you know, they're willing to, take the low road to, to take, you know, get to the high ground. So um, anyways, I could, I could go on. A, I have a blog post specifically about testing on the toilet that goes through like the history and talks about how the program grew from uh, basically a joke in a meeting to somebody posted some issues in London. Um, and then my friend uh, Anna Ullen, who uh, Luis tells me is probably the first Spaniard at Google, and that sounds about right. She became the first testing on the toilet uh, coordinator worldwide, and then grew the operation to you know having volunteers solicit all these new episodes, having people review them, having people willing to actually go to the bathrooms and physically put things up, um, and then you know as things get big and successful, there's drama. So you know you're really having an impact when there's drama. Um, we had um, uh, let's see, we had some. You know, groups in different offices try to compete for the space, and it's like, you know, a little turf war in the bathroom, which I thought was kind of ludicrous. But then we, you know, came up with a compromise. It's like, hey, we'll rotate, a, you know, an episode on something maybe not strictly testing related. That way, there's no turf war. You get a wider audience. It's not just your offices. It goes everywhere. So, you know, we were ha definitely having an impact because um, uh, it was really arousing some sort of reaction from people. And then, like I said, if it's any indication, 11 years later, they're still publishing episodes every week. Um, so I think um, even though the effects are hard to measure directly, like I said, it, it got people engaged in the conversation in an unconventional way. People were getting the information about small, medium, large tests, mocking, dependency injection, you know, how to test distributed services, yada, yada. And they were doing, it was happening in a uniform way. Everybody was speaking the same language over time as, you know, incrementally this knowledge. And it wasn't just like, here's a 500 page book to sit on your desk. You know, it's like just one page a week. That's it. Um, so I, I'd say it had a pretty phenomenal impact. I would, I would guess that measuring things in the toilet is maybe not the most appropriate thing. <laughs> but if anybody would do it, Google would. Yeah, indeed. Uh, any any other questions, guys? Okay. So, is there any way to uh, do have this kind of impact without the support from someone from the uh, from the upper part of the organization? Like, for example, I think that in most of the organization have been, everyone values testing and automated testing, but then when you are looking at to review a PR. I mean, you have to have a lot of conviction to say, no, I'm not merging this without, your, without a test, mm -hmm. especially in code that has like 10% coverage or no coverage at all. So unless you have a really, really strong conviction, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to push things 
from below mm -hmm. without, I mean, I think that the difference that you have is that you have a dedicated team of evangelists. Mm -hmm. Do you think it will work with, without this team in another organization? Uh, so short answer, yes. Um, because remember, uh, the mercenaries came a year and a half, two years after the grouplet started. And the grouplet was a self-organizing band of volunteers. Um, we didn't have explicit executive support, which actually turned out to be, um, actually helped us. Because we couldn't just rely on, oh, well, Larry Page and Sergey Brin say we have to test our code. And people are like, fine, we'll write some tests, we'll get some coverage. You know, t the tests suck, but oh, look, we've got 90% coverage from our one test kind of thing. Um, so, but the, the thing that they did do is they did give us that space to kind of explore how to create an effective set of tools and practices and to deliver that message in an in a, um, effective way. So I'm, I'm very anti, like previous iteration of, iterations of these talks, I explicitly say I'm anti authorita which is, if you're South Park fans at all, I don't know how many people are familiar with South Park, but, you know, Eric Cartman, you will respect my authorita, you know. Um, I'm very much against those kind of mandates. Um, and the, the brilliant thing that Google had going for it is most of its executives had been at, you know, places like Microsoft, Bell Labs, Sun Microsystems. They had seen this pattern before where some executives like, this is the greatest idea since sliced bread and everybody has to do it. And even if it was a good idea, it would die because people, their heart wouldn't be in it. Um, so I think it can be done without explicit executive support. What's important though is, like you said, there needs, unless somebody is so committed, they're willing to, you know, really force themselves to butt heads with people. Um, what you need is to create that space. Uh, you need executives, managers that are like, maybe I'm not so sure, I don't know much about it, I'm skeptical, but I'm gonna let the people that really care about it try. So the extent to which maybe you've got a core group of hard-headed instigators that can connect and say, you know what, we're gonna start putting this message out there, we're gonna figure out how to communicate to the managers and executives that are at least sympathetic to the idea of experimentation and you start there. And then maybe, you know, things trickle out of that um, experience where suddenly, you know, there's a little more space to try something else and then more people get on board and then you, you can grow it. I mean, I'm speaking very abstractly. It sounds very fuzzy, but the truth is, um, you know, why do we have millions of programming languages? They're all Turing complete, right? Why do we, why do we even bother going beyond assembly? It's because, you know, there are problem domains certain languages lend themselves to versus others and different comfort levels. So what I'm trying to describe is sort of like the assembly language uh, pattern that you want to look for and then figure out how to translate into the language of your organization. Um, hope, hope that was relevant to what you had in mind. <laughs> oh, cool. Uh, maybe one last question and then we, there's like refreshment. Well, I can talk faster and cut myself short if there's more. <laughs> No, no, but again, we'll probably stick around for, for a while. There's sure. some refreshments, so I'm, I'm sure if we stick around, there's many people interested in, test, in testing, so we can have further discussion. How did you face the fact that maybe people uh, didn't want to change because they don't think that the change is going to work mm -hmm. or neither they don't want to take more responsibilities in his day-to-day? -day? Well, fortunately... Um, and I actually have a kind of a research idea that I don't know I'm ever going to implement. Um, so you remember that, that curve, the bell curve, and there's the different um, categories of instigators, early, late majority, and laggards. So you'll have the laggards who will just stamp their foot, and say there's no way, testing is a waste of time, whatever. But they're in the minority. A lot of people that I've talked, well maybe not a lot, but some people I've talked to are like, well most organizations are laggards. And my suspicion is that they're not, but the laggards tend to have more of a voice in typical organizations, right? So it'll seem like most people don't want to do this when really there's a couple of loud mouth people and everybody else is staying quiet because they don't feel safe. Um, so 
if you've got that model in mind that you know don't let a few loud stubborn people deter you from trying to reach everybody else then you know you save them for last you try to find a way to connect with the rest of the organization that maybe they're not speaking up they're not taking you know big chances but they could take little chances and, and you can help them out the other thing with laggards I actually have one of my favorite stories from this experience as a test mercenary was with a laggard. He, um, I, the first test mercenary project I joined, uh, the tech lead asked us to come in. Most of the team, they were pretty, you know, they were open to the idea. But there was this one guy who thought he was going to work his way up to be a manager, and he was acting like he was like on, you know, he wasn't anybody's manager, but he was keeping tabs on what everybody's doing. And he saw us come in, and he's like, what? You guys are just going to waste everybody's time, the features to deliver, whatever. So I said, OK, let's go have a chat. So one day, we had just a one-on-one -on -one out on the patio. And we had an airing of grievances. And um, at some point, it came out that um, he was frustrated with the fact that their team on the other side of the world every night would break the build so that when the team in California came back to work the next day, what was working the day before after they updated their, you know, their working directories, it would break. And I said, ah, how about this? Let's get a continuous build in place. You know, it's part of my test certified thing, but I'm not even worrying about getting people writing tests at this point. Let's just say we'll have a build and everybody has to just keep it green. So he agreed to that. And we got that running, and there's more to that story I could go into. But the relevant part is that about a year or two later, I get this email. He's like, hey, Mike, how's it going? Yeah, I'm on this other project now. And by the way, yeah, so um, you were right. I, I make everybody do testing now. It's great. We can't do anything without testing. And it only took me a year or two to figure that out. So hey, <laughs> so there you go. Even laggards can be flipped, um, possibly. Uh, so keep the faith. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so maybe we will close it off here. Again, if you stick around, there's some refreshments and, and you know, we can chat about testing and, and coding and engineering as well. And yeah, I would say thanks very much for your talk. It was awesome. Thanks for having me.